how to show Sean some tough love. It's it's interesting um, because I have heard stories and been in relationships where you know I'm being ignored because he's running out with his friends or, or doing things with human beings. But but he's doing this with a video game, something that's just a computer. It's 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 not real. How does that feel that he's choosing that over you, a human, beautiful woman and child? It feels like the life that I'm trying to give him, the life of me and Madison isn't good enough. It's just not enough for him anymore. Mm -hmm. well, give me some examples of when he's choosing the game over you. Um, I have two examples that really stick out. Um, on his birthday in June, we were supposed to go to a birthday dinner, and he kept telling me, five more minutes, five more minutes, and it turned into hours, and we ended up missing his birthday dinner. And uh, also when I was um, in labor... I'm going to skip this because there's one other video here. Oh, this is the ending part. This talk a lot. The talk show. I'm back with Dr. Gary Corjad, and he's about to help Autumn make her fiance realize that if his video game addiction isn't over, his engagement will be. And Sean is here with us now. You, you hear what you just said, Sean. That's what Autumn is feeling. Like, she can't take it anymore. Why do you think you play so much? I, I started playing because I was pretty scared of my daughter. I didn't want to get too attached for the SIDS reasons. And SIDS reasons? Like the death syndrome? Yeah. You know about SIDS, right? I got dangled over my head. SIDS. Have you had experiences with SIDS? No, I just heard a lot about it before. SIDS, sudden infant death. Oh, yeah. Where the kid like rolls over and sleeps like that and then just dies. But. Huh? Like, <laughs> Dr. Garrett, do you buy the whole SIDS scare? No, no. Me I mean, it just that doesn't quite feel right. I mean, I think scare is the right thing. I really do, Sean. I think that, you know, I, I know you told the producers that you started playing this game when Autumn was six months pregnant of the baby. And in my mind, I think that what you were scared of is actually having to show up and become a father and at some point become a husband. And you know, for a young guy that maybe isn't quite ready for that, it sounds good in theory, but man, when push comes to shove and you see your wife ready to deliver or your girlfriend, that becomes very real. How do you feel when you're not playing the game? A little anxious to play most sometimes, but if I'm doing something, I'm fine. Oh, but if you're not doing anything and you're not playing the game, it's shakes. Sometimes. Are you addicted not. to video game playing? Oh, God, yeah. Like a real addiction? Yeah, no, I mean, there's a whole new thing in the DSM-4, you know, the psychological manual. People, as the internet becomes more and more powerful, it's a huge more addiction. More powerful? Some people are addicted to porn, some people are addicted to just the relationship with the monitor. I mean, it's incredible. But if people spend over a certain yeah, number I love of my monitor. Week, uh, with it, and if it takes them away from their real life, that's what we call an addiction. And that's what's happening here. Are you afraid that she's going to leave you, Sean? I am now more than I was. Yeah. I heard her say it. I just didn't realize it. Everybody looks so worried. Well, are you willing to do some drastic measures? Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to not play it again. Willing to not play it again? <coughs> are you willing to get rid of it? Yeah, I can Are you willing to kill work? All right, there's a lot of yak, yak, yak. All right, that's been done. He says he wants... Before we do that, what does it mean to you? That is what is ruining our relationship. That's what's ruining our family. What does this mean to you? Nothing now. No, what, what does it really mean? Is it something? It was an escape for a while. It is an escape. Yeah. Still. So this is your friend that's kind of, you know, kept you company for a long time and distracted you and taken you away from your real life and welcomed you into the artificial world of Warcraft. That's not a friend to me. Wow. I'm very impressed. So you're saying goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, <laughs> She's so happy. Hey, applause, applause, applause. Yeah, that's what they do over there as well. Applause, applause. Success! Happy times!
Okay, so Hans, what's wrong with this video? No, there, there is something that you have yet to come to at the first video. Something that the girl said. Oh, can you tell us? What did she say? Just tell us. About how the problem started when she started putting on weight after she gave birth. Okay, that's good. Okay. I didn't show that part because yeah. there's just too much talk in there. That. But that's true also. Um, the psychologist... That's a big key also. Yeah, it's a bit key. I had to jump. Too long, the video. Um, it's the entire show, actually. So, okay. the psychologist or the pseudo-expert says that it's a form of escapism for <coughs> the guy. <coughs> but how many of you think that he that's the end? That means he'll be okay after that. No, no right? Why do you think this, Why do you think they showed hit them shredding the CD for? What's that for? It's, it's seen as symbolic. Okay, symbolic. That is the end, right? But as Hans knows already, obviously he's spending too much time on YouTube. <laughs> I don't know watching what. <laughs> Besides your. Just happened to saw the website. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, so you're pretty on. You actually check the blog all the time. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Model student. Um. Anyway. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> So we know that Hans likes Kylie Minogue also, but that's another story. <laughs> hey, that's, that's another story. Okay, okay. Back to here. Um, what we've seen is that talk shows, TV talk shows are quite sensational, right? It's kind of like tabloids. Why do you think they're so popular in the States? Very simple reason. Because people want to see other people's problems. Okay, that's true. The idea of voyeurism. Free stuff? Yeah, they get free stuff. Oh, like the <laughs> Oprah Winfrey show and how they got cars? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of really exaggerated expressions in the show. Um, which could have been cute, like action, and then you cheer. You know, it's pretty scary. If you go, if you actually attend, the, if you join them as an audience, you see a lot of cue cards and things, lights and all that. So, there's also fake applause, which prompts you to applause. They also plant people in the audience to clap, so everyone else claps. There's a lot of things going on. Um, what's that? It's worse here, actually. Really? The audience do not exist in the recording at all. Oh, yeah, that's safer. In the images. Yeah, it's safer that way. I realize that, too. They use clip images, like real, like the local because game shows, right? I was doing this show with Jeremy. Right. And there was no one else but us. But when I actually see the footage on video, uh, on, on TV, there were audiences. Ah. I wonder how they rotate, though, because every show you see the same lady clapping <laughs> something. <laughs> like so one of you, anybody who blogs or is interested, should start capturing these things, and you know maybe you can say why is the audience always the same? You know, it'll be interesting to find out. Okay, but in any case, uh, the reason why I showed this clip was because later on, one of the segments we'll be talking about TV talk shows, and. Uh, well, to, to kind of answer you why they're so popular, it's all about TV ratings. They're very popular, okay? But the question here is, do they have adverse effects on people, youths especially, teenagers who watch them? Are their so-called visions of reality skewed because of these shows? It means, do they all see World of Warcraft players as game addicts, okay? So that's, that's one of the questions, whether or not it sensationalizes and therefore whether it trivializes issues and so on and so forth. So we'll go into that in a while. But first, um, I went through your, your responses and I, you know, there's a whole bunch, but most of you left very good responses and I'll actually show you a little content analysis I did on your responses. But I thought City gave a very interesting response. Where's City? City, not in class? Okay, very good. <laughs> okay, anyway. City said that many people prefer conducting surveys to gather information as it is probably the easiest method to carry out. I guess it's true to a certain extent, but many factors should also be taken into account as, as, so as to prevent skewed or biased surveys. For example, convenient sampling, that's true. Uh, a lot of academics use college students because it's a very convenient sample. Um, types of questions. Um, target groups and so on. Blah, 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 blah. I personally feel the experimentation method has more oomph when it comes to gathering information or testing hypotheses. Although it is tedious to carry out and many factors, variables are needed to control, to be controlled, it produces more credible results. 
Unlike surveys, I do not have to travel to look for victims and would need a controlled environment, pre indoors preferably for my experiment. With this, I can avoid interferences from other factors around that might jeopardize my experiment. I hope to administer an experiment in future so as to get a sense of the process. Okay, so there are some things that are true in there, there are some things that are, that are iffy, but the point here is that it's partly true. Uh, surveys do end up being one of the most convenient samples, uh, convenient ways of uh, doing research. I have to make sure that it appears on screen once in a while. Are the most convenient and judging from your responses, that seems to be very true as well. As soon as it appears on screen. Okay. So, <coughs> continue where we left off. Previously on chapter two. So I looked at all your responses and true enough, 64% of you guys picked surveys, probably because of your experience with it and so on and so forth. But there's a distinct difference, which I'll talk about in a bit. That is, there's a difference between conducting a survey and conducting a good survey, okay? I've conducted surveys before, and I've shot myself in the foot many times because of certain questions that uh, could have been better framed, okay? Sometimes we end up... Um, Hello? Yeah. Sometimes we end up priming our respondents in which the answers would be biased and so on and so forth. There might be other factors involved. So what's convenient, it does have its downsides, but it doesn't mean that it's invalid. It doesn't mean that it is um, useless, okay? It's just that we have to be just as careful as when we do our experiments as well, okay? It's not, it's not entirely easy to do, all right? So in terms of breakdown, 64 of you guys gave sample surveys as your choice and explained that you're experienced with it, and so on. Um, the epistemological approach, if I pronounce it correctly, uh, the idea that uh, you simply, not say simply, but you sit and watch, you observe the environment, and therefore you come up with the variables and uh, cause and effects and so on. That's an approach that a lot of sociologists use because they don't want to tamper with the environment. They want to see the environment for themselves. So some of you use that approach as well, which is pretty interesting. And they explained it. Um, the other popular one next to surveys, the idea of experiments, a lot of you like the idea. Um, experiments, if done correctly, it can be very difficult to do, very time consuming, uh, a lot of, sometimes a lot of money is involved. Um, can you yield very uh, reliable results? Okay, because you control literally as many aspects or all aspects where possible, all the variables, manipulating only one. Okay, in which, for example, if you want to see if <coughs> violence affects youth differently, you could lock them up in a room and then expose them to violence and so on and so forth, and then see the different effects. Okay? Um, some of you also talked about content analysis. Like I mentioned, content analysis is quite accessible, doesn't involve people at all. So some, some of us consider that as a very um, honest way of approaching things. That is, you don't manipulate anything, you just observe the content. However, there's, there's the coder bias as well. That is, as people, we can sometimes be biased when we judge a particular thing, whether we code it as violent or not violent, and so on. So there, are, there, are, there is variability as well, as I mentioned, uh, coder reliability earlier. Okay? But on its own, content analysis is very accessible. You take a piece of media and you analyze it. Okay? And then there's the rest of you who, I put the shiitake mushrooms, because I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Okay? Shiitake, instead of saying sh, then you say shiitake mushrooms. <laughs> so, yeah. So the rest of you uh, might have been eating shiitake mushrooms because I have no idea what you're talking about. And the purpose of this assigned little response was for you to pick one and explain how to use it. But then you started giving me a whole history about what, um, not, not shit, but what <laughs> scientific methods there were and all that. Which is good, good for you guys, but I wanted you to take one and go with it, okay? This ties into my, the COM2125 one, one, uh, assignment where some of you did a very good job explaining um, certain phenomenons, okay? But you didn't read the instructions, so you kind of got a zero. 
The whole point is you have to read the instructions and work smart. Don't waste your time. Read carefully and do it. Okay. All right. Moving on. So sample surveys, <coughs> huge, huge thing. A lot of people are doing it, but really, what's involved? So um, while content analysis focuses on message content, surveys focus on people. Okay. One of the most popular. You might want to take notes because. The printouts for this are delayed. I'll have to give it to you in next class. Okay. One of the most popular ways of investigating people is to ask them questions directly. Right. Now, this is all in your textbook. If, if you have your textbook, guess what? Highlighter, textbook, ta-da! No writing involved. Okay. So you might want to try that. And then you can also scribble on your textbook. Then when you sell it, Second hand, the next person will gain even more knowledge. Okay? Alright. Okay, I'm going to move along. Sample surveys. It's employed since it's difficult and expensive to question an entire population. And I mean the word sample in this case. Why we do a sample? Okay, it's very difficult to. to question or interview an entire population of people. It's been done before. Census, that's an example. A national census where they literally try to get everybody, okay, adults mostly, and they interview them. But those are very costly and uh, need a large amount of researchers to do that. Okay? <coughs> so that's why we do a sample. And to add on to that, thus a random sample is used as a representation of the population. Notice that a lot of things are, yes. Oh, you guys should have told me. Oh, actually that screen is for me and that screen is for you. So we should swap it around. Okay. Holy cow. Give me a sec here, let me get this computer thing fixed. Yeah, okay, better. Okay, good eye. So, sample surveys, okay. Random sample. All right, this is much easier to read than just now. Um, moving on. Okay, sample surveys play a vital role, for example, in the elections process. All right. For example, John Kerry and George Bush used sample surveys throughout 2004 elections to see where they needed to concentrate in terms of campaigning. All right, and. It's a huge deal because if you go look at how much they spend in terms of campaigning, it runs in the millions of dollars. It's pretty crazy, just, just campaigning. Those, that money is just to promote themselves to get elected. Think about that money if instead it were used to help America instead. Okay, so I guess that's why they make it such a big deal that they get the campaigns all done right because there's a lot of money involved. Sample surveys are often used to understand people's media habits. In this case, I can test, for example, if YouTube's re replacing uh, TV just by interviewing people. How, 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 much hour, how many hours you spend watching YouTube versus TV? Actually, a lot of you. How many of you are watching? I mean, how many hours of TV are you watching now? Okay, let me put it this way. Do you watch more YouTube now or more TV? YouTube. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Um, there was a, I don't know if you saw it or I put it up as a slide once, but there's a, oh yeah, one of the bloggers, one of my friends who's into PR, he recently went to blog. He's been using a lot of data that's been collected by different web agencies. And one of the things that we found <coughs> is that the top 10 most visited websites for Singapore includes YouTube. The top 10. Guess what are the first few? Make a guess, just a guess. Friends though. Friendster is in the list, but it's not the number one. Okay, close enough. 
all the email services, Gmail, Hotmail, MSN. So those definitely dominate. But it's surprising that YouTube, Friendster are there. Okay, so goes to show that a lot of people are really into all these multimedia things and social networking and so on and so forth. All right. Another thing I could test is whether citizen journalism blogs or blogs in general are replacing newspapers. And there was a statistic last year that showed that newspaper circulations was dropping. All right, and they are desperate to try and figure out how to get back at revenue dollars and all that because that's how they survive. So if you notice, a lot of newspapers now, not only do they have online versions, they, most of them now also have RSS feeds for their news. Some of them make you pay like Straits Times, which is real boo-boo. I was saying how people who are abroad, like myself, who go study abroad, we, we read the news, local news, we want to keep in touch, right? And here you, you have Singaporean uh, news media agencies making you pay for it. Which is really sad, you know, you have Contact Singapore and all that thing where, you know, there's all this government, in, government, government initiatives to bring back Singaporeans or bring back, you know, people from abroad. And then our own local news media charges for everything. You know, if I want to watch TV or listen to the internet radio in Singapore, I have to pay for it too. It's crazy. I mean, I haven't seen other, any other country do this. So, like I said, again, short-term gains, monetary gains, long-term effects. You know, if you made it free, everybody has access to it, people might want to come home. You know what I mean? We're losing brains to other countries, for example. Okay? All right, but in any case, so um, the case of newspapers, um, they are losing circulation, and it could be because of blogs. Blogs, as you know, one of the accidental or side effects of it is that they actually filter news, they filter the news, they talk about news. Uh, there was an interesting experiment, very casual experiment, wasn't done properly, but this lady, she was interested in finding out whether or not she would know less of what was happening in the world in one week if she just read blogs versus newspaper. So she read blogs only, and her friend, her colleague, would read newspapers. At the end of the week, they compared notes. They wanted to see who had more knowledge of what was happening, and guess what, who won? Amazingly, the, blogs, the, the one who read the blogs won. Why? Because not only do you get the news, but you get opinions as well. Okay, I'm not trying to say that blogs are like perfect, great, or anything, but I'm just saying that there's a whole shift in terms of power, media power. Okay, power to the people, and so on and so forth. Right. Straight out the 80s. All right, sample surveys. A survey is an excellent way of getting descriptive insight into a given phenomenon. All right, beyond descriptive data. Surveys also let us explore relationship between variables, um, meaning that uh, sometimes you might discover things that you didn't discover before, or that when you have descriptive data, they can tell you things that basically uh, you never actually predicted might have happened. Okay? Good data will tell you that sort of thing. Good data will uncover new relationships, new variables. All right. For example, do children who tend to watch more TV, also tend to be more obese. Agree, Jonathan agrees. Oh, example, you're a living... <laughs> you're pointing yourself a living example, is it? Okay. No, no, you don't look obese. You look quite fit. Like rugby player. Yeah, anyway. By making random phone calls, this is what uh, these researchers did, there were two of them. By making random phone calls in a, in a specific area code, Researchers could solicit politely <coughs> for each child's daily viewing, TV viewing habits as well as his or her weight. Okay? Well, it's two variables we're looking at, daily TV viewing and weight. They asked a string of questions related to that. Okay? So, the following surveys are real. In 2003, Journal of American Medical Association, or JAMA, JAMA published a survey of over 50,000 women and found that TV viewing related to high levels of obesity and type 2 diabetes. So I guess not only are they eating a lot, but a lot of candy and sugary stuff. Okay, so snacks, snacks. All right. Then in 1991, this is way earlier, Journal of Public Health published a survey of nearly 50,000 adult females. Don't ask me why they keep Oh, sorry, 5,000. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, don't ask me why they keep serving women. I 
no idea why they don't do it on the men. But they just love to pick on women. And guess what? They discovered that obesity was twice as likely to occur among those who viewed four hours or more TV per day than those who viewed one hour or less. So if you're going to watch TV, watch for one hour or less. <laughs> well, I'm doing an, a direct implicate, Im, implying directly, but of course that's not going to be the case. Okay? All right. How do we start a survey? Some of you said that it was very easy, but I'm going to run through the steps here. So even if you know, there might be some things that you might not be aware of. Okay? Just, just pay attention. Researchers Stacy Davis and Mary Louise Marsh decided to conduct a survey of American adolescents to explore the possibility that watching TV talk shows has negative effects. Okay? So like the Tyra Banks show. 1998. This was done in 1998. So what they did. First, they got a sample. They had 292 students from two public high school and one private high school from North Carolina. Okay, at this point, I want to ask you something. Notice that they wanted to survey American adolescents, okay, United States. Notice that their sample was this. What's the problem? Say again? It could be random within North Carolina. Okay, correct. Yeah, that's the more exact answer, but yes, randomness does matter. It's not random throughout the states, but it was limited to North Carolina. So, it wasn't a random sample. Okay, both of you got it right. So, going back to what we learned earlier, there could be something, caution, there could be something idiosyncratic about this North Carolina sample. Maybe, you know, part of the culture involves sitting in front of TV a lot or something, so it could change things around, I don't know. Um, which might not apply to other U.S. high schoolers, okay? So we need to be aware of these things when we look at data, surveys, and so on. Try to look, read between the lines, like say, hey, it's, it's not random, and so on and so forth. So they had a questionnaire, it contained questions about attitude towards social issues that are typically featured in TV talk shows. So they didn't talk about the TV talk shows, they just talked about what attitudes they had to social issues in these questions. For example, school shootings, and teen, teen pregnancy. Okay, they ask about these things. To prevent priming, okay? Now this isn't in your textbook, priming. Questions about talk shows were asked later. Okay? So imagine if we had the talk show questions come up first, then they might very be aware that, oh, you know, I better not say that I watch all these TV talk shows. It might make me look bad or something. So it might prime them, they might be biased, we don't want that to happen. So we control for that by arranging, by having a certain order to the questions, okay? To prevent priming. If you're not sure what priming is, it's not in the textbook. You'll, it might be in the later chapters, but you can also look it up on Wikipedia and everywhere else, okay? Just to get an idea. All right, so that's the questionnaire. Then what you do is you get descriptive findings. They generated statistical summary which provided them a descriptive glimpse of the phenomenon under investigation. So once you collect all the data, you can start to see trends, you can start to see relationships, you can start to see whether or not more TV viewing equals to changes in social attitude and so on and so forth. Okay? Because everything is all in numbers and so on and so forth. You can also do a content analysis on your own um, on your own uh, survey results. For example, if you have an open-ended question, you could have a coder sit through it and look for keywords that they mentioned. Okay? So that's a lot more work. So surveys can be a lot of work, depends. Okay? For example, in the survey, it showed that 46% of students watch, watch talk shows either sometimes or every day. So that's quite a lot. We also look for statistical relationships. Researchers discover that heavy viewers of talk shows tend to overestimate the real world frequency of phenomena such as teen sex. Why do you think that's the case? Why do they overestimate? Because they're so used to seeing it every day on Okay. Well, on the ball, that's on the ball. Uh, the idea here is that these TV talk shows, what they do to get ratings, good ratings, is that they generate sensational news. 
news that doesn't actually occur every day, but because it's shown every day, we start to have a very extreme view of the world, which is very dangerous. Okay? Very dangerous because you might go out and have phobias of everything. Oh, I cannot play World of Warcraft, I cannot touch games, and so on and so forth. Okay, which is not true. Furthermore, these viewers do not trivialize such issues. It means that their, their view of such issues becomes actually quite serious. They actually have take a very serious stance towards it. For example, if you watch Tyra Banks and World of Warcraft, and let's say you don't really understand the World of Warcraft phenomenon, which a lot of, a lot of adults and some people who don't go into the internet as much might not get a good sense. And this, is, this might be all that they know or the only contact they have with the internet through Tyra Banks, then it's pretty scary. scary okay? They start to view everything with extremities. Um, in America, parents, parents get influenced um, by the media a lot. For example, the uh, sex predators on MySpace and all that. It doesn't happen all the time, but the news media keeps harping on it until parents get really scared. So much so that MySpace now um, actually has um, there are people look through MySpace accounts and starts to they, they actually compare it with those um, sex predators. There's this list that the police has. They actually start comparing it with their database to find who the sex predators are. But they didn't have to do that at first. They're just doing it because of um, social pressure, okay, which was incited by the news media, okay. Because if you think about it, MySpace, yeah, sure it's popular, but all the other social networking sites have been around for a long time, so. Why, why target MySpace? Okay, just an example. All right, moving on. Okay, don't need to talk about that. Interpretations of findings. Davis and Morris concluded that <coughs> the sweeping condemnation of talk shows view, talk show viewing was extreme. Even though they did find some, did have some findings, but they, they thought it was pretty extreme. The data did not suggest that US, US youth were corrupted by these shows. Okay. They were somewhat influenced, but it wasn't to a point that it should be taken too seriously. Okay? In fact, to prove that, they found that both light and heavy viewers were equally intolerant, intolerant of talk shows. So it didn't matter how much you watch. As long as you watch it, you kind of have a certain point of view already. Okay? All right, so that was what they found. Now, moving on, there are different types of surveys. What I've gone through is an entire process of how surveys, survey works. Now, it's different types. And um, if you brought your handout, you actually, this handout actually does a good job, survey methods, of explaining the difference. There's a cross-sectional survey as well as a longitudinal survey. The cross-sectional is something that you're very familiar with. It's something that you do for your class most of the time and all that. Why? because we don't have much time. Cross-sectional surveys are one sample, one point in time, that's it. Okay. So it's a, what we call also a very convenient, uh, convenient survey. So it um, doesn't mean that it doesn't yield better results or anything, but it just, it's just that um, the other method, the longitudinal one, might be more, uh, might reveal more information. Okay. So moving on to longitudinal survey, it occurs, these surveys occur more than one time with sometimes more than one sample, okay? Often with more than one sample, okay? So these are harder to do, but they can give you real trends. They can reveal certain things, okay? So we'll go into that. There are three kinds of longitudinal survey designs, namely trend studies, cohort study, and panel study. Right. Yeah, your, your notes also does a good job. So in the textbook, they talk about it, but your notes also explains each one very nicely. Okay. The handout. All right. Trend study. For example, repeating survey with students that age, of their age group from the same school every five years. So trend study would mean, for example, if I were to give a survey to you guys five years later, I'll give the survey, same place, same school, but with a new batch of students of your age. Okay, so that's trend study. Different sample group, if you think about it. Similar by certain attributes such as age or school. Okay, so that's trend study. 
a little bit easy to get confused as I move along. So just try to try to pay attention here. Cohort studies. What's the difference? For example, performing survey on students who are in the same age or cohort. Okay? So it will mean that I follow you from here. If I do a survey here five years later, I might do a survey on the same bunch of people as you go to college or university or wherever you, you are. Okay? Um, oh wait, no, this one's different, sorry. <laughs> this one's different. I will follow you in terms of the age, but I might take a different group of people. All right, that means that, let's say, right now you're 16, let's say. Okay, imagine you're 16, wow. Then, let's say five years down the road, I interview 21 year olds. It could be a different bunch of 21 year olds. Okay, but you don't want it to be too different. In this case here, I'm still following um, students in an academic setting. So I might go to a university instead. Okay? So cohort studies. Doesn't have to be the same group. Okay, even I got confused there. It doesn't have to be the same group, but it has to follow the age. Okay? That means uh, 16 now, five years down the road, I interview 21 year olds. And probably the same kind of people, for example, students. Alright? Different sample group as well. Now for the third one, panel study. This is the one that is hardest to do, but um, for those people who have done it, it, it's, uh, it can be pretty remarkable. It can get a lot of interesting results. Performing survey on the exact same people over time. Very difficult. It's rare because it's hard to track these people over time. Let's say you're interviewing 100 or let's say even 50. You have to really keep in touch with them throughout the years. And there, are, there have been research done like that where it trails the person from youth all the way till old age. And um, it's very fascinating. In a way, when we blog, we are kind of like performing our own panel study on ourselves because we're, we're documenting our activities and everything. Okay. It's able to de detect trends that no other method would be able to. It's a very, very expensive, very difficult thing to do. Okay. So there's, those are the three main um, types of longitudinal survey. The idea of longitude also gives you the idea that it's for a length of time versus cross-sectional that is, okay, right here, right now, that's on target. Okay. All right. Now, the textbook doesn't mention this, but um, I thought I'd go through it because some of you are survey, survey fanatics, and I thought that I should also curb you guys and let you guys know what are the limitations as well. Note that surveys do not directly measure people's behavior. Although we directly question them, surveys only pick up individuals' chosen responses. I can choose what I want to say. It doesn't mean that I actually do it. Okay? If I'm embarrassed about something, if the question is about sex, it's about gaming, and I'm embarrassed about it, I could change my answers. In other words, survey can tell us what respondents believe to be true. Sometimes they might not even be aware of themselves. For example, if I ask a question of uh, how many hours do you spend viewing YouTube, you could say, oh, I spend five. But in reality, you might not be realize you actually spend ten, or so on and so forth. It might not be accurate in that sense, because you're making the respondents become researchers themselves. They have to start asking themselves, I did do that, um, I didn't document that, how would I know how many hours? I just go by gut feel. So, they could tell you what they think is true, or they could even lie. Okay? So there are limitations. It's not the best. Um, the other ones, such as um, experiments, experiments for example, you're actually looking at behaviors themselves. So that's kind of a more honest approach. Okay. Still, it doesn't mean that surveys aren't useful. I've done surveys where I combine a survey with an experiment, with a pre and post survey, which I'll talk about in a while. Okay. Okay. So a little diversion here before we go into. Uh, doesn't mean a break, okay? I'm just saying I'm talking about something else first. Before we go into experiments, okay, let's talk about causal, cause, causal relationships. There's a reason why, because experiments are all about it. We're documenting causal relationship, um, and it involves claiming that one thing, example, a media message, is causing another 
change, example, change in attitude or behavior. Okay, so that's in essence what causal relationships are. So in the case of causal relationships, we have three criteria, kind of like we have rules of Fight Club. Right? Come on. Okay, first, empirically related. They have to be related um, as variables. We should be able to measure the relationship. Okay, if we can't measure it, then it's kind of useless. We have to be able to measure it in terms of numbers, quantifiable numbers, Come, quantifiable, quantifiable okay, relationship. There has to be a time order. One thing has to happen first before the other, obviously. Okay? We need to see which, which causes the other, which one comes first. And the third thing, third variable explanations. This is tough. This is tough. Why? This is to account for other things that could have changed or affected the effect, might have caused the effect. Say, for example, you say that violence Viewing violent media causes kids to be violent. Okay, sure. But do you take into account family background, family history, take into account drug use? These are other variables that you could consider. So you have to make sure that you account for these things. If these kids are clean, okay, that is, everything spick span, family history is okay, and you're sure that uh, the only introduction of a variable is, is the um, media viewing behavior, then yeah, then you're set. So you have to account for that. So those are the three rules. So the point is to determine whether two things in question are empirically related. And to do that, we first need to establish our variables. Okay. We cannot make casual guesses. There is a precise way to do this. How do we de determine our variables? Okay. There's a way to do it. And how do we measure the relationship? So to measure the relationship, we do this thing called correlation. How many of you have heard the word correlation? Okay, good. Any of you done any SPSS or anything like that? Say again? No, there are other packages like I think SAS or something like that. Uh, but um, those programs, they help you do correlations. They they offer you charts and all that to help you visualize the data. So the point here is to determine whether two variables are related. And to do that, we apply a statistical formula to data to compute what we call a correlation coefficient. Okay? And uh, this, normally you don't compute by hand. You use a computer. Because let's say you have 100 data points. Um, it might be possible to calculate by hand, but a computer can just you can just enter the data points through a spreadsheet and then it will tell you the correlation coefficient between two variables. Okay? A positive correlation is when one variable increases and so does the other. For example, increased viewership of TV might lead to an increased uh, viewer's weight. Okay? That's a positive correlation. In a negative correlation, it's when one variable increases while the other decreases. So in this case, there was a, a hypothesis that people with higher income actually watch less TV. Okay? I don't know how it's true. Okay, it could be several reasons why, but that might be the case. A perfect positive correlation, that means a direct one-for-one -one effect, will give you a score of plus 1.0. Okay, that's a positive correlation coefficient. The coefficient is the measure, if you think about it. It's the measure of how correlated they are. Okay, I'll show you some charts later to, to kind of explain that. A perfect negative would, of course, be a minus one. Okay? So these two charts, what do you think the first one is? What's the correlation of the first one on the left? One. Good, good. One. What do you think the second one is? Ah. Oh. Um, uh, let me see, one, two, three. I think it's very hard, but the computer computes it. It's definitely a positive correlation. How much? It's plus 0.85. Okay. The shift is calculated there. Those points that you see, this is called a scatter plot. Any of you seen a scatter plot before? Okay, good. In a previous class? Oh, okay, so you guys are actually very um, on the ball already. You guys know what's going on. Scatter plot, those are the data points. Those are the different uh, pieces, the, the data that was collected 
from different people. Okay. So in this case, here's negative examples. Minus 0.54 and minus 0.19. Because you realize that it's almost a perfect line diagonal down. It's a minus 0.94. All right. So some um, terminology here. A statistically statistically significant result is one whereby the result is unlikely to be due to chance, i.e. high probability. Okay? We want to look for statistically significant results. If we end with uh, if we end with one of these charts that kind of like tapers in the middle, just flat lines or something like that, then there's a very there's very little significance to it. It might not seem to point that this does lead to that. It might not be very useful. Okay, we want to see either in this case here a negative perfect or whatever, and it doesn't matter. Sometimes this is enough. Okay, it depends on how uh, precise you want to be or how strict you want to be with your results. Right, so we're looking for statistic statistical significance. Huh. Okay. So the next thing that we talked about was time order. That is the variable said to be the cause that precedes the variable that's seen to be the effect. So there's an element of prediction here, what you think is happening, and then you go look for it. Okay. And the other point, the third one, was the third variable explanation which shows that after we establish the empirical relationship and the time order, we need to ensure that the observed relationship is not due to other variables. Simple and short, that's what it means. Okay. So back to our third method, experiments. Experiments gather data from people. All right? Dif shh, quiet. Different from surveys since it gathers data under controlled environments. Okay? Surveys, you tend to go out there and you go find people or you could invite them to come to you. But this is whereby you control the environment. It's very difficult to do, time consuming. Experiments also follow three criteria of the causal relationship. Back to the causal relationships again. Okay? The variable identified as the potential cause of another variable is known as uh, I don't know. Oh, sounds sharp. Yeah. I mean, all you have to do is to open the textbook to the page and you get the answer. Correct. Independent variables. Ding ding ding. <laughs> so the other variable is of course the dependent variable. So get this right. Independent variable means that I don't really care what's happening out there. I'm the cause. And then we have the dependent variable. Oh, what's he doing? <coughs> Whatever he's doing, then I'll follow. So you can think of it as that dynamic, okay? One depending on the other. So the independent com comes first. Okay, this is a very easy to test topic, so pay attention to this. Okay, moving on. Experiments often employ random assignments of the sample. All right. Differences that emerge can be confidently attributed to the manipulations itself. So you want to be random with your sample um, so that you, you have no other attributes that could be causing the difference. Only the manipulation could be the thing that causes the difference. Hey, you guys, you know, if you want something, you have to do whatever you want to do. <laughs> Okay, so you guys want to break? All right, fine. <laughs> that was pretty pathetic. I thought you were gonna cheer like B R E A. What? One more time. Do it. Do it for me. Do it for me. One more time. Start. Let's have the whole class do it. Okay, you say. Give me a B. Twelve thirty. Come back. <laughs> 10 minutes from now, come back. <laughs> okay, carrying on. In most experiments, there are two groups. Experimental group and a control group. Most of you know this already. While we manipulate variables for the experimental group, the control group isn't manipulated so as to offer us a benchmark to confirm our results. 
Okay. It's like a, literally the name, the name sake already explains it. It's a control group. Okay, it's one that just offers us to see whether these people are indeed affected by the manipulation and nothing else. So if the control group also gives us a similar result to the experimental group, then we know that our variable has no effect. Our independent variable has actually no effect. Okay? So that's benchmarking. That's control group. Control group and benchmarking go hand in hand. If we're interested at, in heart rate, the heart rate caused by different games, we could do a pre and post test. Okay? A pre test. <coughs> So different games as in sports, okay? A pretest would be before the independent variable, so before the game itself. And a post test would be after the independent variable, that is like after the game. Okay, so specific sports, they were testing like this sport, that sport, which one causes uh, increased heart rate rates and so on. So pre and post tests. If we're interested in a heart rate caused by different games, we can also just do a post-test only design. It means you don't do a pre-test, you just do a post-test. This is almost like a cross-sectional survey, but this is after, realize that this is, this is, this is um, experimental, as in you have the effect and then you do a, a, a survey after that. Of course, the pre and post will give you a better result so that you have something to compare with, but in this case, it only tests after the Manipulation itself. Post test only, that is after independent variable. Okay. In the case of this researcher, his name is Dolph Zillman. He was testing a mood management theory. Okay. So he had 116 college students randomly assigned to one of the three experimental conditions. The independent variable would be mood. Okay, he was testing for, uh, he wanted to see what kind of mood would cause what effects. And the dependent variable would be music choice. Okay? So the question here is really, do you listen to music according to your mood? All right? So do people actually choose their music? What do you think? Do you pick your music? If you're unhappy, you listen to sad music or happy music or what? Maybe the opposite. Yeah, you tend to pick something else. If you're happy, you want to be sad, so you listen to sad music. <laughs> or if you're feeling a bit too gay, you could be listening to death metal, so you become more manly, right? <laughs> I don't know, I'm just giving a really <laughs> dumb example. <laughs> I don't know, I just think uh, Kali Minogue and all that, so I, I, I'm just talking nonsense here. But in any case, um, so he was testing this, and I think it was a very useful test. Okay, experimental results. What happened was that he found that bad mood participants selected energetic or joyful music more so than the good mood, good mood participants. Now he manipulated, this, there's one part that I didn't talk about which was in your textbook. How do you get participants to have bad moods? Make them unhappy, yeah. So he had this test that he made them go through and he had, it, it wasn't a test that was recorded for the experiment. But rather this test made them feel happy or sad because um, they would fill out this test form and then he would give them a result saying, that, oh, you got it all wrong. And really it didn't matter, but he just wanted to give the result as all wrong or all right. So if it's all wrong, they would tend to feel very defeated and unhappy. And then those that um, who got it all right would tend to be happier. Okay? So that was how he manipulated the people in terms of mood. It could be, yes. I mean, if the person doesn't really care about the test, like, ah, oh, okay, so what I always feel anyway, then it doesn't matter. That's true. So he had to find particular ways to measure that. That's part of the experimental design. We, it's very hard to account for everything, but what we do is we try our best. Okay, so um, in this case, I guess he was looking at the really bad mood people and the really good mood people, and he found these results. Interpretation of results. So the theory was true. People in bad mood selected media that would make them feel better. Okay? Results are very useful when the same results can be observed over and over again. That means you can replicate the experiment. 
All right? If we do it second time, third time, and we still don't get the same results, then we know something is wrong. The theory doesn't stick. There is no So one person says validity and everybody says validity. <laughs> validity is true, but there's a better word for it. <laughs> okay, it's almost there. Yeah, anything that ends with ability can already, right? But really, um, generalizability. When it can be replicated. Okay, so replication is to prove generalizability. This other method also does that. It's kind of like replication. It's called convergence. And it's when we use different research methods that still happen to lead to the same results. So if I did a survey on whether or not you listen to music um, according to your mood, and I had a series of questions like that, and it also ends up with the same response, same results, excellent. You have replicated it, you have done convergence on your tests, <coughs> and so you have a very solid theory. Okay? So these are the ways which we prove, we prove the validity of the theory and so on. So, the last one. Uh, Andrea? Is Andrea, right? Wait, I keep forgetting. What's your name again? Melissa. Melissa. Okay. Um, how do you pronounce this? Okay, epidemiological. <sighs> See, I just wanted you guys to feel how tough it is saying all these big words the whole day. <laughs> the approach is an observational science. Okay, the approach is an observational science. Involves studying media impact in the natural world. There's no manipulation involved, and it finds connections by observation. All right, so like I mentioned earlier, for those of you who came late, sociologists love to use this method because it involves them being in the natural environment, observing human behavior. In a way, it's a very truthful or honest way of approaching it. But then again, same thing applies, researcher bias. Okay? Researchers can invoke their own biases on the results. Since there's no control, there are chances that also third variables can affect the results. So that's the danger of it. Okay, every method has, it pro, has its pros and cons, and you pick one based on what you think is appropriate for your study. Okay? So in summary, oh, summary, there are four scientific methods. Content analysis, sample surveys, what's the other two? Yeah, that thing, that approach. Okay. There are three, three criteria for causal relationships. Somebody. Empirically related. Time order. Yeah, that blah, blah, blah thing, right? Yes. That's a good question. They seem very related. They, they, they are very related. Um, I'm not sure how you distinguish between both. I haven't heard so much of epistemo this huge, weird thing. Ep epidemiology. I haven't heard so much of that, but I've heard more instances of ethnography. That's why I'm having a hard time pronouncing this. But really, in, in, in our social sciences, I don't hear so much of this. Maybe it's an old word compared to ethnography, because ethnography is something that's done you see a lot of research papers mentioning ethnographic approach and so on and so forth. They seem to have the same kind of approach. So I wouldn't discount that they are pretty similar. Good. All right. And guess what? Wow. It's like I just keep going on forever, right? It's D and... Yay! <laughs> oh, thank God.
This is the first time you can actually get applause for doing the lecture. It's so strange. And the best part is when you finish. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, it's true. I thought I was going to run over. There's so many things to talk about. But you guys are smart, so you guys understood. Uh, the handouts will be given to you next class. And remember, there's going to be a class presentation for the next one. And I need you to pay attention to the class presentation, each one, because your responses from now on are not only going to include the readings, but they're going to include your responses to the presentations as well. I want to get a feel of what you thought of their presentations, okay? All right, that's it.